We're honored to have our first speaker join us this afternoon, Chairman Ros Peter Roscom of Illinois. He was uh, recently chosen by his colleagues to chair the House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee. Uh, Chairman Roscom is the representative of the 6th District of Illinois in Congress. He is a thoughtful and pragmatic legislator and has a proven understanding of health care. In his new role leading the Health Subcommittee, Chairman Roscom is focused on issues from Medicare to health insurance premiums uh, to health care costs. He is uh, also taking a lead in fighting the opioid crisis that is ravaging so many uh, parts of this country. Uh, before taking the helm of the Health Subcommittee, uh, Chairman Roscom played an integral role, a key role, in crafting last year's historic uh, tax law. Uh, and if his uh, professional accolades uh, aren't sufficient, uh, we found this tidbit buried deep in his biography that he once bicycled across the country from San Diego to Virginia Beach. Uh, I don't think we'll uh, discuss cycling this afternoon, but I'm sure he will touch on many vital topics. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to uh, Chairman Peter Roscoe. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chip, for the generous introduction and for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you this afternoon, and I appreciate your hospitality. So I have a quick story to tell you. Um, my mother is 87 years old, and she lives about a mile from us in Wheaton, Illinois. My dad passed away about three years ago, and so we're very intentional about having my mom over. You know, I'm a good son, and my wife is a good daughter-in-law, so my mom will come over for dinner with some frequency, and not long ago, I was seated across from her at the dining room table. And she had a weird look on her face as she was looking at me. And it was a little bit unsettling, and I'm no physician, but you know, a weird look on an 87-year-old is not a good thing. And so I said, Mom, are you okay? Are, are you okay? And she said, how do you stand it? I said, what? She goes, your job, being a congressman, how do you stand it? Now, this is a woman that's watching a lot of Fox News, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, but I think she represents the disposition of a lot of people out there. They look at the political landscape and they say, this is ridiculous, and how is it that our country has come to this point? And I went back and I assured her that this is not really a new season that we're in in our public life. Now, I will, I will acknowledge it's challenging, and I'm not here pumping sunshine telling you that, that we don't have very serious things to deal with. But Chip mentioned that I was active on the tax debate. And what the tax debate taught me was that if we are tenacious and we're disciplined and we're clear-minded, we can get some things done. Now, if you look at the tax debate in particular, there's a relationship between the tax debate and tax reform and where we are in the healthcare debate. And it's fascinating. The social scientists and the economic historians are gonna have a field day in 50 years when they look back and they juxtapose these two big debates. And here's where, here's, here's some things to observe about them. With the tax debate, it was fascinating because there was no defender of the status quo on our tax code. Said another way, there's nobody that was out there saying, oh, the Internal Revenue Code is great, just leave it alone. Nobody was saying that. Similarly, nobody liked the Internal Revenue Service either. I jokingly told the then commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, I said, you know, if you were choking on the side of the road in my district, most people would come up and they'd lean down at you and they'd say, I don't think you're gonna make it, and they'd just keep moving along. <laughs> So you had nobody that was defending the Internal Revenue Service, nobody that was defending the status quo or the tax code, and it created an opportunity for us to do something different. And what happened was, while there were different voices and, and not everybody came together to say, let's do one particular plan, what ended up, interestingly, there was an opening where we could get something done significant. Okay. Now take that debate and shift over and do a little compare and contrast as it relates to healthcare. Healthcare feels very different. In healthcare, you've basically got two sides and they've kind of fallen into 
the health care debate and the, de and the debate around the Affordable Care Act is really orthodoxy. It has reached that level of um, political discourse where it's basically orthodoxy and you've got one group that is a strong defender of the ACA, you've got another group that is scandalized by the ACA and very little, uh, very little ability to interact. Well, I assumed this chairmanship of the health subcommittee about a month ago and followed on the leadership of my predecessor, Pat T. Berry, who's a very pragmatic, smart guy from uh, Columbus, Ohio. And what I decided was, I came in and I talked to our team and I said, look, we've got we've to think about this environment that we're in and we've got to break this down and we've got to uh, understand it within a couple of different contexts. The first context is a context of the calendar, of timing. I've not been in any aspect of public debate in the United States that is more deadline driven than healthcare. It's more deadline, healthcare is more deadline driven than tax policy, it is more deadline driven than energy policy, it is more deadline driven than education policy, than foreign policy, you name it. Deadlines have driven this, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that the, the, the question is, what do we do with those deadlines and how do they manifest themselves? Okay, what did he just say and what does that mean? Here's what I said and here's what it means. We have a collapsing window of time in this Congress between now and the August recess when we can expect to do things from a legislative point of view. Well, let's take advantage of that. It's an election year, so we know after August, members of Congress go home, then you're into the election cycle, and you've got a date certain by which we can take advantage of things and we can master the deadlines and move forward. The other thing though, and I'll talk about those deadlines and I'll talk in a minute about um, how we can take advantage of these next several months, but if all we are doing is managing deadlines, if all we are doing is lurching from one thing to another thing to another thing, I think we're really underperforming. And I think that we have an opportunity to cast a bigger vision ultimately. So I represent suburban Chicago. I represent the west and northwest suburbs of Chicago. And if you were to go to my constituents by and large, you know, it's a district that's business oriented, it's a district that's international oriented, you know, people going in and out of O'Hare Airport, a lot of those types of things. If you were to ask my constituents on health care, ask them what their first principles would be, here's what they would tell you. They would say, look, I want to make sure that I've got the very best health care that I can for me and for my family, and I want it to be to a price point that's reasonable, and that the cost drivers are making us healthier. Or said another way, let's remove the cost drivers that are not making us any healthier. That's the first thing that they would say. The second thing they would say is they, they're not interested in, in relitigating a national discussion about pre-existing conditions. They would say, we like the idea of people with a pre-existing condition having access to an insurance pool um, you know, within reason, and they want to make sure that that is, that is a protection. They're not interested in moving back. Now the third thing is, this is a technically savvy group of people who are interested in having access to transformational technologies applied within the healthcare space or within their interactions with their health system in the same ways that they see it interacting with other places in the marketplace, albeit they want to make sure that these things are safe, obviously. So I think that what we've got to do is get back to first principles as it relates to healthcare. And I would argue that over the 2017 healthcare debate in the United States, which was not a very fruitful enterprise when it all came down to it, because not much happened as a result of it, as a result of all that, there was a, a diminution of first principles. And so I think we need to get back to first principles. Okay, so let's go back to what, what could we do in these next several months. There's, um, there is a, an initiative that Chairman Tiberi undertook. It got swept up and kind of pushed by the wayside based on the tax debate, but we're renewing this effort right now. And that is to go to the healthcare providers, to you and to others, and to say, identify for us the things, either in statute or in rule, that are uh, overwhelming, that are um, 
complicated that are not making us any healthier. In other words, what's the regulation that is a sticking point? And we've got, an, we've got several hundred submissions uh, from the association and others that have, that have come in. And here's what we're trying to do with that information. We're trying to build out a political constituency on a bipartisan basis on Capitol Hill that looks at those things and says, we agree that that is a burden. We agree that that is not fruitful. We agree that that's something that may have had a time in the past, but its day has come and gone. And we agree that we should remove that and allow more flexibility for our health care providers. Now, here's the thing. If this becomes a big discussion about the ACA, you can imagine it's very difficult to engage on that question because both sides will go into their corners and it becomes shirts and skins, basically. If, however, people are able to look at this objectively and say, you know what, that is a big hassle. That doesn't make us any safer. That's not helping any patients. Let's revisit that and let's get rid of that. Now, there's a challenge, and I'm not here pumping sunshine telling you that this is not without its challenge. The challenge is one person's patient protection is another person's regulatory relief. Okay, I get it. So let's try and separate out and let's try and winnow these things down. And there is, a, there is an example that we can look to that is wildly successful in doing this. On an annual basis, Congress will come together and review a number of our tariff proposals that are out, um, that, that, are, that are pending. And we'll come together and say, does this tariff make sense anymore? Does this industry, uh, are, are they still there? And so forth. And there will be, uh, it's well vetted, it's well understood, there's no surprises, and you will find overwhelming majorities of the House and the Senate will support these tariff changes. Why? Because they've been identified as being obstructions that don't make any sense. In other words, their day has come and gone. So what you're going to see now from the Health Subcommittee and the Ways and Means Committee is work along this, along this line. With the backstop of a date certain at the August recess, we're going to be evaluating the submissions, and it's not too late to submit other things, but we're going to be evaluating these submissions we plan to have roundtables to go through them in a little bit more detail on a bipartisan basis. We plan to move forward and, and we would intend to have a hearing and ultimately mark these up with an eye to getting these on the president's desk. Now, you've also heard from the secretary, you know these sorts of things that are happening at CMS as well. So I think that there is a, uh, I know that there is a serious effort that's underway to identify these things, to isolate them, and to build a consensus around the changes. I had um, a discussion not long ago with a hospital system in my district who brought to my attention just an obtuse situation that they found themselves as a re result of a CMS review where they were being forced to move a, um, an, an AC shaft that posed no danger, and I mean no danger, but based on some ridiculous technicality, they had to move this AC shaft from, you know, to, to, to create it to the tune of a million dollars it cost them, and it was, it was absurd, it was gratuitous, it made no sense, and that's exactly the type of thing that we're trying to, to identify to say we can do much better than this. Here's the other thing. The situation as it relates to opioids, is completely overwhelming us. And I told a group a couple of minutes ago, when, when interacting and when understanding and discussing the opioid crisis, there's no sharp person that I've seen or heard that comes in with any hubris. In other words, there's a lot of humility here. This is a system and this is a, this is, this is a crisis that is, that is grabbing people and destroying families and ruining lives. And there's not a lot of clean hands here. But the days of a big percentage in being paid at pointing fingers, there's really not much of a percentage in that. And I think we're going to be much better off if we realize we can do much better. There's government statutes that are in place that have been complicit in this. There's regulations that are in place that have been complicit in this. There's provider activity. There's uh, industry activity and so forth. Okay. So we all know that nobody's hands are clean necessarily, and the smarter move is for us to take one step 
and another step and another step. And I think the illusion that we could come under is to think we're going to come up with the big plan that's going to fix the opioid crisis once and for all. And if we're chasing the big plan, it's a pipe dream. And, and we ought not do that. What I am proposing is that we take a number of steps, take one thing and another thing and another thing, and, and it can be cumulative this, and then um, be able to evaluate our success on a cumulative basis. Our founders created a system that had a low view of human nature. And they had a system that was highly suspicious of the concentration of power. They rejected a monarchy, as we know. They even rejected, our guys rejected a parliamentary system because they basically viewed it as a legislative gang. They came up with three co-equal branches of government with which we're entirely familiar. Well, therein lies the nature of our challenge. We have become, I would argue, an instant gratification culture. And I put myself right at the front of this parade. So I'm not sanctimonious and I'm self, not self-righteous. Like you, I want what I want when I want it, and I want it right now. That's just who we are. I, I fly a lot, and so I get on my airlines app, and I have an expectation that I can pull out my phone, I can clip, click on an icon, using two thumbs, by the way, and I can get a flight, I can get a seat, I can get an e-ticket, I can get a boarding pass, all sent to my device within the twinkling of an eye. And I'm telling you, if I get 15 seconds of that reloading thing that spirals around, I'm like, what loser made this? This thing's junk. OK, it's ridiculous. And I know I'm describing you, even though I can't see you. I know I'm describing you. And we're all in this together. OK, so what does that mean? How does that have an impact? What that means is we've got to recognize that our founders created a system that they didn't put any percentage in getting things done quickly. They didn't value it. Our founders valued restraint. They valued consensus building. Said another way, they said, if you can't agree, you're not going to do it. And so I think as we approach these things generally, we are going to be much better off if we break them down and we take one step and another step and another step. Let me make one final point before we open it up for questions. I think that we're, we're approaching the cusp of where we are on the tax debate in a little bit of a different way. With the tax debate, there was a general recognition over a period of time that our current tax code was not sustainable. There was just most folks, one of the reasons they didn't like it was it had become obvious that it had become an obstacle to growth. It was complex to the point where it was just being absurd. And there was also the notion that the rest of the world had sort of figured things out. And we were able to take advantage then of what became a transformational moment, and we've updated the tax code, and good things are now happening. I think we are approaching this same point on healthcare, because I would submit, I think we're going to be having a very different discussion about healthcare within the next five years. And I think the healthcare environment that we're in right now is going to be different five years from now. And here's what I know. It takes a significant period of time within our culture, within our political culture, and within our policymaking culture to normalize a concept. In other words, you can come up with the greatest thing. It could just be, you know, wow, just absolutely fantastic. But until people get a sense of it, until they understand it, and still there's a bunch of papers on it, and a bunch of hearings, and a bunch of op-eds, and a bunch of this, that, and the other, then they're really very, very uncomfortable with it. And go back to the nature of our founding, which is a restraining influence. So what we have an opportunity to do now, I think, and where you all are right in this, is to be thinking about the healthcare system to which we aspire. And I think that's a very exciting thing to be talking about. That's a very exciting thing to be a part of. And I think you, in particular, have an opportunity to drive so much of this debate because of how you're structured, because of how you're positioned in the marketplace and because of your own past experience in the, in, in the past and the success that you've enjoyed. 
So I just want to let you know, I, I know I speak on behalf of a lot of people when I say I'm glad you're here. Uh, Washington, D.C. has a wonderful plan for your life, and uh, it's good that you're actively here and actively participating in things. And I know that policymakers greatly benefit knowing that you've come, knowing that you're taking the time to interact with us, and knowing that you're giving us the perspective that only you have. I don't know what it's like to run these big systems. I've never done that. But you have, and you've got perspective, you've got credibility, and you've got know-how, and we desperately need it, particularly as we're moving into this next season of our public debate about health care. So thank you very much for the chance to be with you. And Chip, I think uh, you're going to ask me easy questions that make me look good. No, I'm teasing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Very cool. So with, uh, we have microphones in the back, and, and please, um, uh, anyone that has questions, please go to the microphones. Uh, as as uh, some in the audience are, are heading to the microphones, uh, let me ask a, an initial question uh, to get us going here. Um, during the tax um, debate uh, in the Senate, uh, Senator Collins was promised a vote on uh, mitigation legislation uh, for the current situation with the individual market and the, uh, the exchanges. Uh, that, that vote never occurred, but a lot of discussion has occurred post-tax uh, reform on that and in the context of the current legislation that's being considered uh, to fund the government. Um, where do you think the sta sta stabilization legislation regarding reinsurance or paying for the cost-sharing may go, and uh, will we see any action there? It's hard to give you a straight answer because it's, it's, it's an unpredictable environment. But that said, I would be surprised if this debate comes to fruition in the next couple of weeks. There's a lot. Um, there's, look, there's strong feelings on all sides of this issue. And there is some thinking that says, well, if you, if you go the route of stabilization, what are the reforms that are in place that would be, uh, that would, that would be part of that exchange? So if you're asking me to, to forecast, do I think that happens in the next two weeks, for example, I would be surprised if it comes to fruition. Is it a, is it a, debate, is it a debatable uh, matter that's going to go away without being dealt with? No. I mean, it's, it's, it's here and it will have to be dealt with. But I, I would be surprised, as, as I'm standing here today, if that happens in the next two weeks. Thanks. I see one person at the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Warren Tardy with HCA out of Nashville. And first, uh, thank you for being agreeing to take this uh, chairmanship. And we appreciate your, your thoughtfulness and your approach of reaching out to uh, uh, the providers to in receive input on regulatory, regulatory reform and other issues that uh, you'll be dealing with. Thank you very much. My question is uh, an issue that's cropped up in terms of the high cost of, of, of prescription drugs. Obviously, this is a, a big issue for the consumers out there. It's also a big issue for us in the hospital community. We have seen numerous generic drugs, long-term brand name drugs that uh, costs have just gone exponentially out, out of the roof. And it's increasing problem for hospitals as we take care of our patients on the Medicare side, on the Medicaid side. How do we get a handle on these rising drug costs uh, for an industry that really is over the top in terms of their percentage of increases in the healthcare sector. So Warren, I'll, I'll, I'll not only see your question, but I'll raise your question. So um, there's, there's also a challenge, and you know this better than I do, in terms of the reimbursements or non-availability non of certain things as it relates to some infections. And so um, this has become a real problem in any number of hospitals in the Chicago area. and you know, what we've got are incentives that are misaligned. In other words, you can have a manufacturer that says, hey, you know what, we're going to, um, uh, we're, we're just not going to make this anymore because this isn't reimbursed at a reasonable rate. So here's where, here's where I, I think most folks on the subcommittee are um, trying to sort out what are the areas, um, all right, I'm going I'm, I'm to take a running start at an answer. It'll be like a Seinfeld episode. It'll all come together at the end, but sort of stick with me. <laughs> I love Seinfeld. So when I was in high school in Illinois, we had a mandatory physical education requirement, and I didn't like it. I thought high school gym was ridiculous, and I told this to all my high school gym teachers all the entire time I was in, I was in gym. 
it, to, to the point where I'm taking a test on field hockey and its history, and I ask my gym teacher, when am I gonna ever have to know this? And she said, oh, Peter, it's very important that you know who the founder of field hockey is. And it turns out it's Constance Appleby. I never forgot it. So um, then I become a legislator, and I'm down in Springfield, Illinois, and all the gym teachers come in to see me, and they say, we've got to keep the PE requirement for, uh, for school gym. And I said, you're talking to the wrong guy. And huh, I'll, I'll come up and I'll vote in favor of the PE requirement if you show me some study that shows that all the Illinois school children are these svelte gazelles that are just unbelievable compared to the rest of the country, I'll vote for your thing. Okay. My point is that what we've got to do is we've got to have a clear understanding of what is the cost benefit of all of this. When I was meeting earlier a couple minutes ago with, with some of your leadership, one of the points that was made to me or that I interpreted was, look, we, we need a holistic approach on health, on, on funding of our hospital system, which makes perfect sense. So in other words, there's this particular item that's gonna be funded or this add-on or that add-on or Warren, whatever it happens to be. But the, the demands on the system itself are much more holistic. So here's what we've got to, here's what we've got to sort out in health uh, as it relates to, to pharmaceuticals. How, what's, 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 the benefit to, what's the benefit to the patient? Are they getting, um, are, are there procedures that are being obviated because of these pharmaceuticals? If so, great, let's celebrate that. If not, then let's, that, that begs the question. So what I am saying to you is there continues to be a lot of interest and a lot of pressure on this issue. The president talks about it with some frequency, and I think that you're gonna be, you know, this is one of these areas where when I said we're gonna be having a different discussion on healthcare in five years, I think that this is one of the areas that's gonna be a driver for that discussion. So thanks, Warren, for the question. Thank you. Any other questions before we go, actually? I think we're just at the end. All right. Why don't we give a, a round of applause uh, to the Congressman? This is great. Thanks. This is great. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you.